Welcome to episode 143 of This Week in Linux, your weekly source for Linux good news. From the Destination Linux Network, I'm Michael Tunnell. And if you're new to the show, this is the podcast that will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take as a 20-year-plus Linux user. Coming up on this week's episode, first of all, don't you don't want to miss the Lugfest that has happened for DLN. That is March 21st, so be sure to uh, bookmark the link in the show notes and also put it on your calendar. March 21st, Lugfest. But this week's episode of This Week in Linux is going to include uh, new uh, applet releases for Audacity, OpenOffice, and if you're interested in making software, there's a new Java or OpenJDK 16 has been released. We're also going to talk about some core news with the X, uh, X Wayland uh, standalone release for 21.1. We've also got some stuff coming up next week that we're going to kind of do like a little bit of a preview for, which is GNOME 40 and the PinePhone beta edition. So we'll talk about that later in the show. We've also got some interesting news from the UbiPorts team with the Ubuntu Touch OTA 16 release, which they say is the second biggest release ever for the project. And also there's a really cool project that I want to talk about, which is an LED cube kit for the Raspberry Pi. If you want to know what that is, be sure to stick around for that section of the show. So we got so we got all that and so much more coming up this week's episode of Twill, your weekly source for Linux good news. Before we get started this week, I just want to do a quick reminder. Like I said in the intro, the DLN Lug Fest is happening March 21st, so you don't want to miss it. We're first going to start off with an episode of Destination Linux. So DL218 will be recorded live at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1700 UTC. This is basically going to be a full day of Linux, so you don't want to miss that. And the episode for DL18 is going to be really interesting. I mean, I know I'm biased anyway because I'm on the show, but I think this one's going to be even more so because we're going to have someone joining us. We're going to have Neil McGovern, the executive director of GNOME, joining us to talk about uh, GNOME 40, so you don't want to miss that. And right after DL218, we're going to share share the uh, Lug Room link with everyone on a thread in the forum. So go ahead and bookmark the link right now. It's destinationlinux.network slash lugfest. You will need an account on the DLN forum to get that link because you'll need to be logged in to see it to avoid spammers and trolls and that sort of stuff. But an extra bonus of that is that you also can hang out in the DLN forum, which is a great experience on its own. So be sure to bookmark that link, DLN, uh, destinationlinux.network slash lugfest to join us for the DLN lugfest. I hope to see you all there tomorrow. So destinationlinux.network slash lugfest and, uh, well, to be a faster way, link in the show notes. Up first in the show this week, we're going to talk about GNOME 40, and that is because the RC, or Release Candidate, has been released in the preparation for the final release, which is happening next week. So this is going to be like a preview. We're not going to cover like the full details because we're going to save that for next week. However, however, also stick around for a little bit because we will be covering something really interesting you don't want to miss related to what we're doing tomorrow. So, uh, but first... So GNOME 40 is got some new updates for this release candidate. They've, they've made some changes to the Eduardo icon theme. They've also made some changes to the GDM, which is the GNOME Display Manager. So this has got better uh, improvements for the fingerprint authentication support, which is great. Uh, they've also uh, made some improvements to their GNOME Auto AR utility, which is an archiving tool, because they've added RAR support back into it, which is nice to see. Uh, because RAR support, RAR is a very popular format, and it's really nice to see them having support for it by, by default like that. Uh, also, GNOME Boxes now uses USB 3 on supported operating systems by default. And they've also added last.fm as an option in the GNOME online account, so that's pretty interesting. And they've added a lot, a lot more, but the, the biggest thing, obviously, for GNOME 40 is the GNOME shell changes. And there's quite a few of these changes. So they've in this latest release for the RC, they've improved some appearance of the app folders, make it smoother to transition from uh, some applications from different parts of the grid. So that's, that, that's pretty cool. They've also improved the way that the workspace it handles uh, secondary monitors and dragging between different things for the app grid pages. Uh, lots of stuff, including ability to start X Wayland on demand when running under system D. We talked about that previously. The The value of this is because it makes it so the applications uh, don't have to have X Wayland running at all times. They can just launch it when it needs it, which is fantastic. Uh, but of course, this introduces the brand new GNOME layout, which re relates to the overview. So there's quite a bit of changes for the overview that are coming in GNOME 40. 
Uh, we'll talk about this in much more detail next week after the final release happens. But for now, there are a couple ways to test the RC if you are interested. You can download the GNOME OS ISO. And real quick on that, the GNOME OS is not meant to be used outside of testing purposes. I know the name isn't clear about that, but it doesn't come with hardware install support for a reason, and uh, that's it. Uh, it's meant to be used for testing specifically. If you would like to test it in, on hardware itself, you could consider uh, downloading the beta for Fedora 34, which does have support. Well, the, the th Fedora 34 workstation has GNOME 40, so if you want to try it out, uh, that's a beta and a beta, so keep that in mind. Uh, so that's pretty cool. But if you want to learn more about GNOME 40 uh, as soon as possible, then of course you should check the links in the show notes. But in addition to that, you want to join us tomorrow for the live recording of Destination Linux because GNOME's executive director, Neil McGovern, will be joining us to discuss GNOME 40 and GNOME in general. So bookmark dealinlive.com so that you can join us tomorrow for that episode. It's happening at 1 p.m. Eastern Time or 1700 UTC. You don't want to miss it. We have a bunch of stuff. Like that entire day is just jam-packed with stuff. So in addition to GNOME 40 interview with Neil McGovern, we're also going to be doing the DLN Lug Fest, like I said in the intro. So be sure to join us tomorrow, DLN Live live.com so much stuff and yeah so if you want to learn more about it i have links in the show notes and also be sure to join us tomorrow for dl dl 218 up next in the show we have a big update for audacity this is audacity 3.0 there are quite a few changes in here we're going to talk about some small changes then we're going to get to the big change so first of all the small changes introduces a new analyzer called label sounds which is it used to label sounds and silences which is, makes it easier for organization in the timeline which is fantastic they've also improved the noise gate effect which is also fantastic to see uh, they've also added support for importing and exporting macros which is very important although it's a small change it is an important change and there's also some new commands for using the last use tool or the last use analyzer to make it faster to do certain things which is also very cool and audacity 3.0 the big thing that happened in this release is that they overhauled the project file format so rather than having like a bunch of files inside of the uh, project so you, basically it creates it all into one file so this is good because this is a pretty big change and the, the thing that's most important is that it will lead to a lot of improvements. For, it'll be ready for performance improvements. It'll also lead to uh, removing some confusion related to what projects are required for an uh, individual uh, uh, Audacity project. Like the, It's called an op file. So this new format is called op or AUP3. And this is really good because it's in a single file, which means it's a lot easier to uh, keep track of. Whereas previously there would be an op file, but also like a project folder, which includes a lot more files, which could be confusing if you lose certain types of files inside of the folder and the project, you know, you could have some data loss. You could also have some issues with audio assets and stuff like that. So it's really good to see that they have decided to overhaul this format structure into a much simpler uh, approach in this single file approach with these uh, the AUP3. They're actually using an SQLite database to make this all work. So it's very cool making it easier to use, but also in addition to that, you also get the benefit of some performance improvements. While they might not be huge performance improvements, they are still there, which is great. So this is a huge change and I'm happy to see that. There's also a lot of cool other stuff in here. If you want to check out the show notes for the link to the blog post related to Audacity 3.0, you can check that out in the show notes below. Up next in the show, we have a big update from the UbiPorts team for Ubuntu Touch OTA 16. They actually say this is the second largest release of Ubuntu Touch ever. Uh, the first largest being OTA 4 when they switch from 1504 to 1604 as the base. So eight, OTA 16 has a lot of uh, improvements. So we're going to talk about uh, the kind of like the, the core stuff and also some stuff related to some applications in this. Uh, so first of all, this makes it so that the amount of devices that uh, the Ubuntu Touch uh, program or operating system works on is 26 with one new added this release, the Samsung Galaxy S3 Neo Plus. And in this release, they upgraded the installed version of the Qt frameworks from 5.9.5 to 5.12.9, which means this is an update to, uh, one, include the 
uh, long-term support uh, functionality. They say that Qt makes up a massive part of Ubuntu Touch and using it saves us a huge amount of time for uh, while creating software and that can scale between phone, tablet, and desktop uses. So this upgrade puts Ubuntu Touch inside of Qt's LTS cycle, the long-term support, and also gives a number of new features. They say that they hope to take advantage of the uh, new features for Ubuntu Touch and their Le uh, Lumiri operating environment uh, fairly soon. Uh, they also said that upgrading the version of Qt is important for the transition from the uh, current Ubuntu 16.04 base to the uh, Ubuntu 20.04 base that they are currently working on. So that is great to hear that they are working on this transition because this is going to be a, a big improvement for the Ubuntu Touch platform. Uh, they've also made some updates to the camera and video recording support for some of the devices. Uh, the, the actual specific devices that have updates to that are going to be linked in the show notes. So check that out if you want if you wanted to see what if you have a device that fits that. Uh, they've also made some updates to the uh, de the default web browser for Ubuntu Touch, which is called the Morph Browser. So the Morph Browser has received a number of upgrades during this cycle. They've completely overhauled the download system, which is a much needed change. Uh, previously, the download system had a full screen page interruption thing where when you started or completed a download, it would kind of like take over the browser. Uh, so that was kind of annoying. This new version has it completely overhauled, which is great because now it uses a simple head header bar icon to alert you of the progress for a download, which removes that, uh, that issue previously, the an interrupting problem. And it also replaces the page for the list of downloads. So it now has like a recent downloads panel, which is also really nice. There's a new tab management page that now allows you to reopen the most recently closed tab, and that does come in handy quite a bit. Uh, there's also some improvements to uh, the browser in terms of custom uh, user agents because they have now re-enabled that option in the browser, which can be quite useful for all sorts of stuff. And they have optimized it for better use experience, or user experience on tablets. So it's it's much nicer in terms of like the the size of the stuff of the the like header bars and the stuff like that in terms of using it on a tablet. And they've also done something that's really interesting. They they now have included in Ubuntu Touch the Anbox installer. Now, Anbox is not installed by default, but the Anbox installer makes it easier, much easier to get Anbox installed. Now, not all devices support Anbox. Currently, just uh, six support it. But if you have one of those six, then it's certainly a really cool thing to play with. So if you haven't tried it you need you, you have one of those devices, be sure to check it out. If you're not familiar with An Anbox, basically Anbox allows you to have A Android applications inside of a box or an, 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 an emulation environment, essentially, what it allows you to have uh, applications that are made for Android running on Ubuntu Touch or anything that supports Anbox. So that's very, very cool. I have one of the devices that does support it, and it, open ups, it opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of what applications you can have on Ubuntu Touch, which is really nice. So uh, of the six, I have the OnePlus One, which is fairly old, admittedly. It's it's I don't, I don't even remember how long how old it is, but it's at least it's like six or seven years old. Uh, but it's surprisingly good hardware for how old it is. So that's kind of cool. And they're also super cheap if you want to play with it. If you want to get one for like playing around with, uh, you know, trying out Ubuntu Touch and trying out Anbox and that sort of stuff. Uh, but it also, of course, has uh, Ubuntu Touch is on the Pine Phone. So if you have one of those, you could try it out. Now it is worth noting that the Pine Phone support is different from this current release because they have a they have builds specifically for the Pine Phone separately from the uh, the work they do on the rest of the devices. So uh, it's a little bit different there. But this is really cool. Uh, Ubuntu Touch 16, uh, OTA 16 specifically. <laughs> if you are interested in checking it out, I have links to the show notes for the blog post for Ubuntu Touch uh, OTA 16, as well as the device list. They have actually a new redesigned page for all the devices that they support. So if you want to check out, see if your phone su is supported on those, that, that uh, new website, I'll have that linked in the show notes as well. So links in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean and their app platform. DigitalOcean's app platform service is a solution to build modern cloud-native apps. Use a simple, intuitive, and visually rich experience to rapidly build, deploy, manage, and scale apps. You actually have support for multiple programming languages like Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, and it also has support for static sites, Docker, and container images. It also offers high scalability and zero infrastructure management. What does that mean? Well, you simply point your GitHub or GitLab repository to the app platform and let it do all the heavy lifting for you. 
Heavy lifting such as uh, handling the infrastructure like uh, app runtimes and dependencies so you can just push the code to production in just a few clicks. It also secures apps automatically but because it creates, manages, and renews your SSL certificates uh, for you, which is fantastic. And it also helps pr protect your apps from DDoS attacks. And this, uh, this whole system, this app platform, allows you to run code with little to no customization because the app platform uses open cloud-native standards. So it'll automatically analyze your code, create containers based on that code, and also run it uh, run those containers on Kubernetes clusters. So this is a fantastic system that does uh, so much for you. It's and it's really easy to use. It's really cool. Uh, they also have are uh, giving uh, a, a free one hundred dollar credit when you get started by going to do.co/dln. So make the smart move like many from the community have and go to do.co/dln to get started with that one hundred dollar free credit on DigitalOcean's app platform. I want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux. Speaking of the PinePhone, let's talk about the PinePhone Beta Edition because pre-orders are coming out this coming week. So it's the 24th. March 24th is when the PinePhone Beta Edition pre-orders are going on, are going on sale. So you can do that. Uh, this next, this release of beta, the PinePhone Beta Edition is called the Beta because it doesn't, they're saying that the software is not exactly there yet to say it's a full release. So that's why it's called the Beta Edition. It's basically the uh, successor to the Community Editions where they were switching different operating systems. And this We talked about this previously where they decided to switch to Manjaro uh, Linux as the operating system and KDE Plasma Mobile as the interface. Uh, we talked about that previously and that's what this is. So the PinePhone Beta is the first edition to do that fully. And then uh, if you're not familiar with what the offers are for the PinePhone, if you're not familiar with the PinePhone, I'll talk about that in a minute with the actual specs. But in terms of like for those who are, the uh, beta edition will come with two different models. Uh, first of all, the one there's a $149 version. That's the two gig of RAM with 16 gig EME MMC storage. And there's also the 199 that's three gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of EMMC, EMMC storage. Every time I say that, I'm going to have to enunciate each letter because it's really hard. That's a really weird term to say. It also includes a USB-C dock for that mo that mode because the that's the convergence package and the convergence package comes with that dock which is really cool because it gives you a 100 megabit Ethernet jack it gives you two USB Type A ports and an HDMI digital video out port, uh, output port as well as a an extra USB-C port for being able to power the device while you're also using the dock. So it essentially this dock allows you to do a lot of cool stuff. You can connect your phone to this dock and then connect it to a projector or an, uh, a, an HDMI monitor or TV or something and essentially use it to have a full desktop environment because technically if you have a Linux operating system, you can switch it depending on like what, what operating system you have put into it. And also you can switch all kinds of stuff. It's just really cool concept. So this convergence dock is very cool. But in addition to getting the ver convergence dock, it's where it's worth it just to pay the extra $50 because you get a, another gig of RAM and you also get double the storage. So I, even if you didn't get the convergence dock, it's still worth the extra money because it's a better phone in that uh, in that context but you also get the convergence dock so in my opinion there's really no reason to not get that addition so there you go for those who already have a pine phone you may be wondering what's the difference between the previous community editions and the beta edition well depending on which community edition you have if you have one of the f later ones like uh one of the like the manjaro or i'm pretty sure the post market os one and on so like if you had the mobian and etc uh, that's that basically there's no difference so because the PCBA uh, board revision is the same 1.2b so pretty much it's the heart it's only the software that's changed and if you want to replace uh, the operating system with what comes on the beta edition you can just do that and essentially have the, the same phone uh, but that's pretty much it just the software is changing and if you don't have a pine phone already it's definitely worth getting checking out the beta one uh, beta edition but if you already have one, then you're good to go. And they, Pine64 also announced some cool stuff that they're working on, such as the uh, physical keyboard that they're working on and a fingerprint reader. Now, the, this is interesting because they these uh, add-ons are going to be connecting through the pogo pins that are hidden by the phone's back cover. 
So you have to return, take off the back cover and then attach these on it to get these features. Uh, but these, it's, it's interesting because it essentially replaces those covers in order to add that functionality. So it's pretty cool that they're doing this. And the Pogo pins makes it, you know, really interesting and because it had the expandability for the pine phone while the pine phone specs are not the most powerful the flexibility it has is very very interesting so let's talk about the specs for those who are not familiar with the pine phone so it comes with a 5.95 inch display that is a 1440 by 720 pixel ips lcd it also has a all winner a64 arm cortex a53 processor as you know that just rolls right off the tongue it also has a Mali 400 MP2 graphics card or graphics chip, and it has Wi-Fi 4, Bluetooth 4, GPS, 4G LTE, and a bunch of other stuff. So if you want to learn more about the specs of it, I'll have a link in the show notes for the details for that. But if, you, the, if you're interested in getting the PinePhone beta, then uh, be sure to check out the uh, pre-order period, which is starting March 24th. They say that you will expect to have the shipping starting in late April, so not that far off. So if, you, if you're if you interested in getting a Pine phone, they're about to be back. So there you go. Links in the show notes. Up next in the show is the first release of x Whalen standalone version for 21.1. Now, this is really interesting because this is the first standalone release for the x Whalen code, which is a separation from the rest of the X-Server code uh, that was going to be made for Xorg Server 1.21. Well, there's no one maintaining the Xorg server right now. And that sounds pretty bad, and it kind of is, but the Xorg server is, it's, it's kind of like a minefield of code. There's been many, many people who have picked it up over the years, and the current uh, situation is that there's no one willing to work on the uh, maintenance of Xorg server as well as the next release, which would be 1.21. So and instead, the team who was working on the Xorg decided to switch over to making the X Whalen uh, code base split off from Xorg so that it could be uh, worked on to migrate to Whalen. So the whole goal is to replace Xorg with Whalen. And this project has been in project production and development for uh, since 2008. So basically, uh, you know, 13 years roughly, and it's uh, it's, it's something that is, is very necessary. So it is good that they're doing this. Now, the argument about whether or not Whalen is ready it has been debated for many years. Uh, but this uh, X Whalen is a piece of software or a piece as a bridge essentially to make stuff that is built for X, like X11 clients, work under Whalen. So by splitting off from the Xorg server, it makes it possible to use the previous version of Xorg while still also making updates to the X Whalen code to provide new features and also make the uh, support for X11 clients under Whalen improved in a variety of different ways. So it is it is good and bad at the same time. You know, it's bad that no one's maintaining the Xorg server, but it's good that there is a solution to still work on the support for Wayland related to X11. So, you know, bittersweet type of thing. Uh, this latest release is important because it's the first standalone, but it also means that more distributions are able to support it uh, and, and for their future releases because... Uh, otherwise, if this wasn't split, they would have to do like a Git snapshot of the X server, which would not be a good idea. So this is a good thing for, uh, you know, at least moving forward, you know, provided that no one picks up the maintenance of the Xorg server. Uh, so Fedora has stated that in 34, they're planning to make use of the uh, standalone package for the X Wayland support. Uh, so they don't have to deal with like a Git snapshot and whatever. Uh, OpenSUSE is currently working to add this to a future snapshot of Tumbleweed. And also Ubuntu announced recently that they're going to be uh, working on this for having support for 2104. That will be coming out in April. So if... Xorg server 1.21 is not picked up by an organization to take over the maintenance of Xorg, and if somehow magic is not involved to make a new release of it, it is likely that more distributions will be adopting this standalone release of x -Whalen. So more distributions are doing that likely because, one, they're going to have to, and also because uh, thanks to a lot of the desktop uh, development teams and the compositors from various different projects, such as Gnome and Wayland, have been working a lot recently for Wayland support. So we are making a transition 
albeit pretty slowly, because we started, you know, the Wayland project started in 2008, so it has been a while for this transition, but it does seem to be making a, you know, very big leap forward here with this split off of X Whalen. Uh, so very interesting that there's also a lot of differences between the X Whalen 21.1 standalone code with the uh, current version of XORG server and that it offers X video in V12 support via Glamour. Glamour allows you to have uh, accelerate the uh, more rendering or render extension formats. Uh, if you want to know exactly what that means, I'll have a link in the show notes for details about the XORG release or the X Wayland release. And the X Wayland uh, GLX provider code uses the EGL implementation now. And also there's been support for the viewport protocol for upscaling uh, full screen applications running at lower resolutions, which would be very important for user, user end stuff uh, because it makes it better to have uh, full screen applications look better on uh, lower resolutions for this type of situation with X, X, X clients under Wayland. Uh, there's also been some improvements for mouse input and keyboard input and that sort of stuff. Uh, it's a variety of different things. So if you want to learn more about this latest release for, or actually technically the first release of X Wayland Sandalon, I'll have links in the show notes below. And speaking of Wayland, let's talk about a new dynamic tiling compositing window manager for Wayland called Vivarium. Vivarium? I don't know. One of the two. Maybe not. Well, we'll just move on. So this particular uh, tiling window manager uses uh, has multiple different features. For example, it has automatic dynamic tiling with your choice of various different layouts. Uh, very interesting layouts as well because it you could be full screen layouts. It also could have uh, individual uh, split screen layouts. So many things. Really cool. It also has per output workspaces. So each monitor can switch independently through the same set of workspaces. And this is a very interesting thing that a lot of tiling window managers have. And it's something that I always thought, why would I really want this? And then I tried it and I realized, yes, I do want this. This is a fantastic thing. Having independent uh, workspaces per monitor makes it possible so that you can have an application that is always available, no matter what workspace you are, you are using uh, on a particular uh, monitor. So for example, you're on, you have four workspaces, you have one, uh, mo you have two monitors and one monitor is your primary and that switches. And then you have another one that would switch that allows you to have uh, basically instead of having to lock an application at, on all monitors or all desktops, workspaces slash workspaces, uh, you can just put it on the one monitor and let it be there the entire time you switch between the rest. It's very nice, and I I understand now why people like it, and I think uh, it's something that should be available to all desktop environments and all window managers because it is very, very useful. Um, that's a slight tangent. Moving on. So this also has a bunch of other features like floating windows on demand if you want to. It also has... X Wayland support if you need it to do. It, it's built for Wayland, but if you need to use X Wayland, so speaking of X Wayland, uh, there's also a layer shell support, which is compatible with tools like Waybar, B Menu, uh, Sway BG, and some other stuff like that. It also has uh, some stat simple static config files. You can also use a more complicated C config if you want to for other features, but uh, by default, it has a simple static config file, which is really nice. And it is using the WL roots. Uh, compositing tools for basically Wayland support, which is nice because they're not trying to reinvent the wheel. They're using an existing uh, pro uh, project for that. So if you are interested in any kind of uh, tiling or you know trying out Wayland and or both, then maybe check out Vivarium. Or Vivarium, I don't know. Link in the show notes. Up um, next in the show, we're going to talk about a new release from the open uh, open source Office suite called Only Office. This is Only Office six point two. So there's a couple new uh, big features, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But first, they've got some uh, data validation improvements, which is pretty cool because it allows you to restrict the type of data or values that a user can enter into a cell. So you can create a document that only allows certain types of data, which is a very nice uh, a nice thing. So if you share the documents, it makes it a lot easier to make sure it's not the, the data is not corrupted by accidentally putting in the wrong thing. So that's cool. Uh, they've also improved. Uh, tables for figures. So it basically lets you easily list and organize the captions for pictures, charts, and other illustrations inside of a document. They've also added slicers for pivot tables, which makes it possible to indicate the current
current filtering state to understand what data is being displayed. So it basically, if you have a very complicated spreadsheet, you can can you can change what is currently displayed at a given time by switching the pivot tables. So that's really cool. Uh, if you're not familiar with that sort of stuff, it's hard to explain it. There is a video that they, they created to explain it. So if you want to check it out, I'll have that linked in the show notes. But let's talk about the big stuff that is in this release. So the biggest thing is probably the ability to support uh, digital signatures now. So this makes it, makes it possible to protect confidential files, to verify the authenticity, and to make sure that there are no alterations being made in transit by having a digital, a sig- digital signature attached to it. And only Office 6.2 also supports password protection for text files, slideshow presentations, and other types of documents. So those two things are very, very nice to see because it makes it possible to make sure that the documents you are receiving are the documents that you wanted to receive. So very, very cool that they added that. And they also added support to connect with the open source file sync software, C file. So this makes it have a bit ability to sync between uh, different, having C file syncing different, making it easier to get files uh, from one computer to another, provided that you use C file. They also have support for Nextcloud and OwnCloud, but it's really cool that they are adding it more options in addition to those. So very, very nice. And also C file is a pretty popular option for file syncing as well. So if you haven't heard of it, check that out. Um, I, I'm not someone who uses an Office suite that much, but I do enjoy using OnlyOffice. I've been using OnlyOffice for quite a while. The UI of OnlyOffice is very nice, and I... I rarely have to deal with any kind of format issues when I'm using it. So I am a fan of this Office Suite. If you have not tried it before, I highly suggest giving it a shot. And if you do want to try it out for only Office 6.2, links in the show notes. Up next in the show is a really interesting piece of hardware. It's an LED cube kit for the Raspberry Pi. It is called LumiCube. I might have said it wrong, but I think it's LumiCube. It is currently on Kickstarter right now if you want to back it. Uh, they've actually already been fully funded within 12 hours of it being launched. So it, you don't, it is happening. There's already a lot of people. In fact, uh, it's already uh, backed by over a, uh, $50,000 as of this recording. So it's, way, it's over that right now. So it's definitely going to happen. So I'm excited. I think it's really cool. That's why I'm covering it on the show. So it is a device that essentially is a cube of LEDs. Now, it doesn't have a it doesn't have LEDs on every side. It has, you know, sides for the, you know, back ports for the different connect, connect connecting to the Raspberry Pi p- uh, ports and stuff like that. So, it's uh the three sides of it has LEDs. The other two sides are uh connecting to uh, you know, the USB and that sort of stuff as re- as well as the other uh sensors and whatnot. So, let's talk about what it all comes with. So, 192 LEDs. It also comes with a microphone, speaker, accelerometer, and gyroscope. It has uh, light and gesture sensors. It has temperature, pressure, and humidity sensors, and a bunch of stuff. It even also has some push buttons that you can control stuff with, and it has a ton of built-in apps. So uh, it comes with a variety of different apps. For example, it has binary clock, a lava lamp, a wake-up lamp, the internet ticker, which gives like news and stuff like that. It also... Um, the, the wake up lamp is kind of interesting. So it starts off really like very dim and then it starts brightening up and taking up more space on the, on the cube. And it's really interesting approach. There's a video that I'll have linked in the show notes to find out more about it. If you want to see all the different things it has, uh, especially also the link to the Kickstarter campaign, if you want to check out more details, uh, it's very interesting. But in addition to the built in apps, it also has the ability to build your own app if you want to, because every component is programmable via Python. So you can just go into their dashboard, which is a web a web app, and you can start creating pro, uh, programs or you know apps for this cube, which is really cool. There's a ton of different stuff. They they demonstrate a bunch of stuff inside of the uh, the uh, Kickstarter video, and it also has support for voice recognition and text to speech. Very cool. So. I am really interested in this. I know it's it's not that critical to have because it's an LED cube, but I really want one for the for the the behind me and the background of the videos and stuff because it just it's just so cool and I want to play with it. And uh, yeah, so I will be uh, getting one at some point, hopefully. Uh, but very cool. If you want to check it out, become a backer in the Kickstarter. 
Uh, the LumiCube looks very fun. You can actually learn programming with it. You can so it's built for the purpose of you know uh, having something fun to build on. So it's not just to have some you know it's it's mostly for learning programming with Python and you know having something cool to play with in order to do it. It has uh, it does not come with a Raspberry Pi. Just be real, real quick, be clear about that. It uh, you're buying the cube itself. You will also need to buy a Raspberry Pi to put into it, uh, which is about thirty five dollars. You know, depending on which Pi you get. But uh, it's very, very cool. Uh, there's different price levels in the tiers, of course, because you know, that's how Kickstarter works. Uh, and it's just anyway, it's something that I am looking forward to playing with because it looks very fun and also uh, you know. Uh, work on my Python skills that has been a very long time since I messed with Python. So I'm looking forward to that as well. And if you want to check it out, links to their website uh, and as well as the Kickstarter and the video, all of those links in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get, re- get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. So what is Bitwarden? Bitwarden is a password manager, and that is a fantastic thing to have. If you don't have one, you need to get one, specifically Bitwarden, because it is fantastic. So it is a way to keep your online account secure by having all your passwords stored in a single application, a single vault that stores everything. In, in addition to storing those passwords in your vault, you also get automatic generation of those passwords, and you can even automatically fill in those passwords on login forms so you don't have to do it. So it is a fantastic piece of software you absolutely need to check it out. You know, if you if you actually have, I've had conversations with people who said that they only use the same password and they're, it's a very complicated password, but it's the single password for everything. That is terrible security. Do not do that. You need to have a different password for each account on every website. And that is kind of a lot to do, which is why you need a password manager like Bitwarden. So you can get access to uh, your passwords on many different types of devices because Bitwarden supports uh, your web browser. It also has mobile apps, desktop application, and even the command line. Yes, you can use a terminal to get access to your passwords. Really cool. And Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end encryption before it ever leaves your devices. So you know that the only person who has access to your data is you. So Bitwarden is the password manager that I use and trust. In addition, because of all these features, it's awesome, but it's also 100% open source software. That's right, 100% open source software, which means the features and security of their infrastructure can be vetted and set and improved by the community. So, and they don't just stop there. I mean, they could just stop there, but they also bring in third-party security firms to audit their code to make sure it is as safe as possible. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started with your free account. But I think you want to check out the premium account because there's a lot of extra stuff in there, and they have one gigabyte encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, and so much more, including priority customer service, and you get all of this for less than a dollar per month. That's right. Less than a dollar per month. You actually get it for $10 per year. That's it. All you need to do is pay $10 per year. You can get a Bitwarden premium account and get all of that extra great features. And also they have uh, business accounts where you can share it with, with people in your employees and a part of a company. You can also have family accounts so you can share it with your friends and family. It's very, very cool. Check it out. Make the smart move like many from the, B- commu- the DLN community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN. So it gets you, lets you get peace of mind for your passwords, knowing that your passwords and, sen- and your sensitive data are being secured by a company that gets open source. So get their $10 per year premium account so that you can kind of show them that you appreciate them supporting open source and the supporting the This Week in Linux podcast. Again, go to bitwarn.com slash DLN to get started. And thanks again to Bitwarn for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Um, next in the show, let's talk about a new search engine that is being created by the Brave browser team. So this is pretty interesting because it's it's not being made from scratch. It's actually because they recently acquired a, a startup search engine called Tailcat. So Tailcat is being was purchased by Brave, which now Brave Search, that's where it comes from. So there you go. Now, what's interesting about the Brave search engine is that they're they're mainly focused on doing a privacy and transparency aspect of it, which is really, really interesting. So they say that this is a search engine to respect your privacy. Now, what they mean by that is that they're not going to be tracking your data. They're going to be t- collecting some data, but they're not tracking any data particular to you for the user. So this is very interesting. They haven't specified how much data is going to be 
uh, collected or what kind of data, but they have said it will be anonymized contributions from the community to improve and refine the Brave search. So it is, it's different in a lot of ways, but one of the things that is really interesting is the thing that they call user choice. So the user choice aspect of it is related to how you get the search results related to ads. So they have two different options. One option is the normal ad supported free search, and they also have an ad free paid search option. And now that is very, very interesting. And they say that they're trying to bring private ads to search uh, and the way that they've done uh, brave user ads as well. So this is, uh, this is, very, very, very interesting and related to, I don't know of any other search engine that has a paid for account so you can avoid ads that way. So I'm very curious to see how this works out for them. Now, they also talk about transparency related to uh, the way that the Brave search engine is going to work. So they say that through our Brave community, users can participate not only in index building, but also on alternative ranking models to ensure diversity and to prevent outright censorship, end quote. Now, this is an interesting approach because they're doing privacy and also transparency, which is always a good thing. So that's cool. And they're also talking about uh, an open API approach, which is for non-commercial projects like uh, Linux and other open source operating systems, uh, that sort of stuff. So uh, they haven't exa actually specified exactly what they mean by that and how that will relate to uh, those types of Linux distributions and that sort of stuff. Uh, but it is interesting to note that the open API relates to the fact that other search engines will be able to use the stuff that they make for the Brave search. Now, that that's really interesting because this API making it possible for other search engines to integrate with their search engine, I'm very curious to see what that means and what that offers the other search engines because it's a, it's just a... It's an interesting idea that I don't know if... like there, There's other things like uh, Bing also offers that as well where you can use Bing search... Like, for example, there are other search engines that you may have heard of that use Bing in the back end. Uh, and but this is kind of like sort of that sort of thing, but with the Brave search. Uh, very, very cool. But quick note, there are some criticisms related to Brave and the Brave browser. So I just wanted to put that out there just so you are aware of it. So there are some people who have criticized Brave in the past from uh, removing first party ads from websites and injecting their own ads. And that, that is a complaint I think still exists. Now, there are also other complaints related to the BAT token system, but I think they fixed those issues. Uh, but the removing of ads from websites and putting in their own ads is kind of weird because it, well, I mean, it's obvious it's, it messes up the website's ability to uh, collect, uh, you know, make money through ad revenue if those ads are being replaced. So that criticism, it's pretty fair. So. It's it's interesting because, you know, some people look at Brave as being a more private browser. Some people look at Brave as being private because it removes the ads and hurts the website. So it, depending on your perspective, there you go. But this Brave search thing is very interesting in terms of the, the user choice options of the paid search versus non-paid search and also the um, the privacy versus you know, the data collection stuff, like they haven't specified exactly what is going to be collected. So I'm really interested in seeing what that is. Uh, but overall, they're claiming it's going to be transparent about it. So very interesting to see how this all goes together and being able to see really, depending on how transparent they are, maybe, you know, how you could make your own search engine. That'd be really interesting. So hopefully they make it open source or whatever so people can see how it works. Uh, I'm very, very intrigued by that. So if you'd like to learn more about this, I have linked to the Brave search engine announcement as well as a link for if you would like to uh, put in your email address to be notified when the actual search engine is available because up like right now the search engine is not available for testing but you could put your email in a get notified list if you would like to be notified about it. I have links for that in the show notes below. I'm next in the show, if you're interested in any kind of uh, programming, you may have heard of Java. If not, well, it's also a term for coffee which is fantastic, but that's a total different topic. So programming related Java, there's a new release of Java and OpenJDK, which is OpenJDK 16. It now allows for the use of C++ 14 language features, 
within the JDK C++ source tree, whereas the prior releases were using the C++ 98 and the C++ 03 standards. What's the difference between the C++ 98 and 14? Well, that's very complicated, but to break it down, uh, it basically means that by switching, they're going to have to update their build system requirements for OpenJDK for distributions to uh, build uh, packages for Java. So it will increase the requirements, but not very much. Basically, it just means that they have to use GCC 5.0 plus or uh, Clang or Clang, depending on how you want to say it, 3.5 plus, which is pretty much every distribution could easily do that because GCC is currently on 10.x and it only requires 5.x, and Clang is on 11.x, and it only requires 3.5 or more, or higher. So pretty much no issue there. Just there you go. So OpenJDK switched to Git recently, uh, fairly recently. So OpenJDK 16 is now hosting their community of Git repositories on GitHub, which is pretty interesting because they switched from Mercurial to Git. Uh, and also OpenJDK uh, 16 provides concurrent third uh, thread stack processing for its GC, ZGC garbage collector, which is a very interesting thing that they're doing because the thread stacking processing does improve the garbage collection quite a bit. But the most interesting change to me is the J package tool for packaging self-contained Java applications. Now, you may have heard of jar files and sort of stuff like that. Now, this is much more interesting because the J package tool allows for launch time parameters to be specified at packaging time, which is very nice. But most importantly, it supports native packaging formats, which means uh, it essentially makes it for a natural installation experience as they describe it. But this, what this is doing is it allows you to create custom, uh, not custom, it allows you to create packages for RPMs and deb files instead of creating a custom package. So you can use a you can use jpackage to create a package uh, to create a self-contained Java application on RPM based distributions or Debian based distributions without having to do any kind of like jumping through hoops. It also supports native packages for Mac OS and Windows of course, but obviously RPM and devs much more important to this top this particular podcast. Uh, there you go. So that is very good news and very cool for the latest release of OpenJDK 16. If you'd like to learn more, I have links in the show notes below. Up next in the show, let's talk about the Humble Bundles that are currently on. Specifically, we have links for multiples if you want to check them out. But I want to talk to you about the Learn You More Code Bundle. Interesting way of phrasing that. Uh, so this is a really cool thing that has a bunch of eBooks related to learning programming languages and stuff like that. So first of all, you got uh, books related to the Rust programming language. There's also uh, Effective C. There's Python books, uh, C++, Java. Also, there's a book called, uh, for PowerShell for sysadmins, as well as Linux command line eBook and even some uh, shell script stuff for Linux shell, shell scripts. All kinds of stuff in this Humble Bundle, Humble Book Bundle. So if you want to check it out, I have links in the show notes for that. Uh, also, real quick, the link is an affiliate link, which will give a small percentage as a, like a commission sort of thing to the This Week in Linux podcast. So if you do decide you want to get this bundle, uh, please use that link so that there is, uh, you know, that affiliate as, uh, aspect to it. So please, uh, you know, use that as well as if you want to get any of the other bundles. Be sure to check out the links in the show notes for those. And uh, yeah. So check it out. I think there's a lot of cool stuff in here. The I, I'm very interested in the Rust programming language book as well as the Python stuff, uh, especially related to that uh, LumiCube. You know, pi, like you know, th this is how things connect. It's like I planned it. I didn't, but it's like I did. So links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the show and the channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many others. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. And if you become a patron, you can join me during the live stream in the recording stadium. Uh, that's the thing that I call the, the room that you can join me as a patron. Uh, I don't know why I call it a stadium, but I do. So there you go. You can join me to discuss stuff between topics and also just to hang out every week after the show in the patron-only post show. So you can do that if you become a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. You can also order the Linux Labor t-shirt or the t-shirt I'm wearing right now, which is the This Week in Linux t-shirt. You can go to dlinstore.com to check that out, as well as a bunch of other stuff. There's also a new shirt for hardware addicts, which is a really cool shirt that I designed. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit biased because I did design it, but check it out. 
I think it's awesome. Uh, Hard Radics shirt is really cool. DLNstore.com. And if you like some more podcast and goodness from me, then check out the latest episodes of Destination Linux and Hard Radics, as I co- I'm a co host of those shows on the Destination Linux network. So go to destinationlinux.network to check those out. Also, be sure to join us tomorrow for Destination Linux 218, where we talk about GNOME 40 with a special guest, uh, Neil McGovern from GNOME. Uh, just a reminder this show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1700 UTC. So join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week by going to dealinlive.com. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tanell with the Destination Linux Network. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux. And I'll see you next week for your weekly source of Linux news.